Lee Zappas, how are you doing? Well, how are you doing, Sean? Um, nice to see um, you. It's good to see you too. Um, I am uh, jealous of your uh, guitar collection. Why, not, why don't you? Why don't, why don't you? Why don't you pan oh, it around a little bit? So. Pan it around. Yeah. Those are my acoustics. These are my electrics. Oh man. Then I have a couple of nice arch tops that you can't see. That um, so. I'm a fishing out of the guitar. I wish I played better, but unfortunately, I never had the. Uh, I always wanted to be a rock star. I didn't want to really be a musician. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. There, there is, there is somewhat of a difference there. Yeah. Um, uh, the, I, I think rock stars make a lot more money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I want our I want my audience to to know how we met to provide a little bit of context. So and it might have been 2005, 2006, sometime in that time frame uh that I did a uh a podcast. I was on an episode of a podcast on OCN and you're listening and uh after the podcast was over i think i had said something about um a black gospel setting of an orthodox liturgy or something and uh, uh i think that you had a similar thought a similar idea yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, so you were like hey let me get in touch with this guy and see if we can work something out so you got in touch with me we started talking um, and, and then we kind of intermitt intermittently were talking, right. Um, we talked for a while and then a couple of years ago by, and then, you know, we kind of refresh the communication and start talking about it again. Um, until fairly recently when the stars aligned and, um, uh, Metropolitan Savas, uh, essentially uh, blessed and signed off on uh, on this project yeah uh, the how sweet the sound project mm -hmm. and um and then the rest i guess the rest is history <laughs> yeah, recent. Re re very recent history yeah very recently uh it's it's interesting because uh so much has changed over the last couple months that yeah. it makes february February 1st, to be exact, yeah. seemed like it was forever ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's very you know? it's very strange because it's, you know, I remember, you know, going back to when we first came into contact, I think social media back then was kind of a new thing and there was a lot of uh, kind of optimism and hope about it, you know, connecting people. You know, in my opinion, it's sort of it's turned into this uh, terrible um, place where people yell at each other and insult yeah. each other and spread, you know, hate and misinformation. And so I got off it a number of years ago. Um, and because for me, it was a net negative. I still like li looking at funny dog videos and cat videos. And those are kind of fun or you know, great, <laughs> great, you know, sporting plays. But for the most part, I think it's a net negative uh, for society. But there is some positives that come out of it, like any new technology. There's People can use it for, you know, good things and bad things. And one of the good things, obviously, was how we met. And, yeah. you know, I, if, without it, I don't think we would have ever crossed paths. Um, and so, I, you know, um, going back a little bit about how I got to this point, you know, I've had a lot of blessings in my life. And one of the greatest blessings was working in the black community for 20 years when my family owned a very prominent and successful black radio station, or urban contemporary, whatever you want to call it, you know, station that targeted the African-American community. Um, so for 20 years, I worked in that uh, community and was exposed to, you know, the culture, the music especially, and um, just the, you know, feeling of, of love that most people have. And and I grew up as an Orthodox, you know, I'm kind of a you know, uh, born Orthodox. And I've, what I've always found is that it's funny, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the converts are way more knowledgeable about our religion than the ones that sort of grew up in it and have taken it for granted. 
and we sort of um, maybe practice certain things that uh, we jokingly call yayology, which is like, you know, yaya means grandmother in Greek, and it's like, you know, those were, you know, they're kind of their, her traditions or what she grew up with are not exactly maybe, you know, based on, you know, church doctrine. But um, so, uh, and one of the things that always has frustrated me about our church, um, the Greek Orthodox Church in America specifically, is the lack of participation among our congregation during a service. Some people sing along, but very few people know the hymns. Uh, we have less and less, you know, uh, Greek, native Greek speakers in our church. Um, and so, you know, English is the main language for most of the people in our community. And so they can't really sing along to the uh, Greek Orthodox hymns. And uh, it becomes, you're becoming more of, a, of uh, an observer than a participant. And so I've always had this idea, you know, having attended a number of um, programs where I've heard gospel choirs. In fact, our our radio station sponsored a youth choir for many years, which was very successful. And, you know, there's a feeling about it that when you get in and you're praising the Lord and in an environment where everyone is participating, as opposed to, you know, watching like a performance like a lot of art, I feel a lot of times I, I'm at watching a performance when I go to our liturgy. You know, I thought, what, you know, what can we do to sort of mel meld these two um, traditions into one and make our liturgy more accessible. And that's, you know, how we started talking about. It. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for reaching out because none of this would have been possible. Um, you know, if, if folks want to know what it is that we're talking about in particular, you can go to how sweet the sound dot net. Um, and uh, there are clips from the concert that we that we did, um, and there's more information there. But without your your financial support, without your vision, um, and without your persistence, uh, not, you know, none of this would have been possible. Um, well, thanks. One thing that you that you did also, and I was noticing um, in some uh, some some words about you describing who you are and stuff on on one of your websites I noticed that uh, you have this you have this phrase good people make great partners good me yeah. people make great partners and it seems as though that you have a uh, a knack for connecting the right people to do the right kinds of projects um, uh, for instance a uh, part of our team is uh, Dr. Marissa Moore, um, and her particular skill set was a wonderful balance for my skill set as far as mm -hmm. how this project went. And I think going forward, uh, all of us together make a really um, a really strong team. Can you can you talk a little bit about maybe um, you know just of just that idea of a good people making making great partners yeah i think i picked that up from my father that kind of ability i'm going to lower this blind because it's a little bright on the light here so give me one second here yeah. that's better the yeah. um so i think you know it's, it's i think of it as one of my strengths you know that uh kind of i know what i don't know and I think I have a very strong vision a lot of times. And it takes, you know, it takes sometimes a while for it to um, come into focus. I mean, I'll have, a, have an idea pop in my head and, you know, I'll mull it over, think about it when I'm driving by myself or if I'm walking. A lot of times it's like I'm listening to music, you know, you know, my musical taste is really all over the place. You know, I like opera, bluegrass, you know, jazz, gospel. I mean, it's, if I were to share with you my uh, Spotify playlist, you know, it would be an interesting psychological um, experiment to go, what, how, what's wrong with this person? The, um, and, and so to me, if I can, as, if I think about an idea, if I have an idea and it kind of stays with me, then I think it's something I'm thinking about pursuing. And needless to say, you know, I'm uh, somebody with, uh, you know, I have limited skills. You know, to me, everyone has limited skills, and but I think a lot of it is, a key to success is knowing 
those limitations. And um, so I've always had a, a, a kind of, a, it wasn't a conscious thing. I've always had like a wide social network, um, you know, and, you know, I had great parents. They exposed me to a lot of different things uh, early on, you know, where my mom was an immigrant. My dad was a parents of immigrants. You know, we had that kind of immigrant, um, we grew up with that immigrant mentality and, you know, we're just, you know, had respect and um, for other people of all different kind of nationalities and, and races. And so I think the, um, so the ability to sort of see talent in other people and their skill set and how you could take different skills from different people, combine them to work towards a common goal, you know, I enjoy doing that and trying to, to find people. I think I'm a good uh, judge of um, character. Uh, when I when I not to being a good judge of character, my wife tells me you know she gives me her opinion, which usually is helpful. And um, but I, you know for the most part, I've been very fortunate in being able to find people that are um, you know have talent and passion for other things. And so going back to that network, so I have you know. If I have I, I like music makers like yourself, you know, people that can make music like uh, I love that old uh, Chuck Berry, Johnny B. Good. You know, he can play the guitar like ringing a bell. You know, I see people who have like this kind of this crazy ability to it's like I don't know what's going on in their brain, but they're whatever they're thinking. It's coming out through their fingers or their mouth or whatever, and it's like it, to me it just blows me away and. Um, whether it's a full, you know, orchestral, you know, you know, Cleveland Orchestra or an amazing bluegrass band or a jazz ensemble that is just, you know, cooking on all cylinders. I mean, that just blows me away. And I think appreciating those music makers and artists, uh, you know, people in business sort of have that skill. We've had a lot of people, you know, approach us about investing in their in their entities and it's always a team. There's obviously a you know a leader, lead singer, if you want to call it that, that has a vision, has brought a team. You know, the ones that can bring a team together are much more interesting to invest in and a safer investment than you know one individual. You know, um, and so I remember talking to a guy one time. He was starting a business and he wanted to raise some money. And I said, Well, what are you going to do with the money? Well, I'm going to bring on my uh, you know my partners and you know full time because they're working you know, working full-time uh, and working part-time on this project, I like to bring them on full-time. And I said, okay, well, what do they do? Well, you know, it turns out they were all engineers, you know, it's like, and they said to them, like, yeah, it's like starting a band with four bass players. You know, he said, like, that doesn't make any sense, you know. Mm. You need a rhythm section, you need a lead singer, you need whatever strings, you know, uh, horns, uh, or at least they need a duo, you know, it's like, um, you know, a, uh, or like they talk about in the restaurant business, um, front of house and back of house. You know, you have that complimentary thing. My dad used to call it, you need a Mr. Inside and a Mr. Outside. And um, so I've always tried to, you know, look for people with talent and skill sets that, uh, you know, excite me and then try to find projects or projects find me that I think I can maybe, you know, help in putting together those teams. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and so where you're from, I mean, you said a little bit about your uh, yeah. about, about your parents, but where you're from, where you grew up, and what your childhood was like. And in particular, if you can uh, maybe talk a little bit more about how music uh, was impactful and maybe some um, early experiences with music and maybe some uh, early, um, you know, influences as far as people that uh, were inspirational and that kind of thing. Sure. I mean, I had, uh, he was born and raised in Cleveland. Like I said earlier, my parents were immigrant stock. My mom came, was born in Greece, came here after World War II. My dad was born here in Cleveland, but his parents were born in Greece. And so I grew up in the Greek community, very tight knit community um, and very active. And what was interesting about from my musical kind of uh, education, if you want to call it that, my parents did a Greek radio program for many, many years in Cleveland. Um, my dad started one in 1949. My mom joined him when they got married in 52. They did it at various radio stations 
in town until the early 60s when they were able to start a brand new FM station with three other partners. And for from 1962 to 81, it was uh, what we called a brokered uh, radio station. So every hour, every half hour, a different ethnic group or other people could come in and buy a block of time and then program it themselves. They'd go out and sell their own sponsors. Um, they'd produce it. They'd host it. Uh, and so I grew up in that environment. And as, when I was a teenager, I um, you know, was always fascinated by the radio business. And I went and got my uh, FCC license. And back in those days, you actually had to take a test and you know, know the difference between an amp and an ohm, and, which I couldn't tell you today. But, um, you know, my dad drove me to Detroit to, to the FCC field office to take the exam, you know, and I got my third class license, which meant you can operate a transmitter. Um, and so I did that. And then I got summer jobs where I'd work at the radio station running uh, recorded programs. And you started at the worst job ever. Uh, I, I would, my first on air job, if you want to call it that, was sat, one summer, it was Saturday night. From 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. to like eight in the morning on Sunday, and um, you know by myself in this you know old building in a kind of a rough part of town back then, and uh, playing one tape after the other and trying to stay awake, and it was very interesting. And, and you know I think back of it now, it's a lot of great memories. But then I progressed to now being uh, engineering, if you want to call it that, being a board op for all the other. Um, ethnic programs, Italian. I mean, it's amazing what we had. We had Italian, Slovenian, German, Polish, uh, Indian, uh, Hebrew, Irish. I mean, it was like I used to joke that any ethnic group in Cleveland that you know could get a hundred bucks together, they they had their own show. And there were some guys that did a, a like nighttime jazz show. Some guys did a. I think the, our station had uh, the first progressive rock station. When I say station program on commercial FM uh, before FM stations converted to uh, full time format, and so I was exposed to so many different forms of music. You know, salsa was a big um, uh, programming block. Uh, Indian, like I said, Indian was a small programming block, but I, something about Indian music really kind of um, you know it just connected with me. And Arabic music, I think it's the whole kind of minor key kind of stuff that, you know, is similar to Greek music. You know, the bouzouki is very um, influential. In fact, I see one hanging over my shoulder. The, um, so, you know, I had this, you know, this exposure to a lot of interesting music. And then I got to college and I went, worked at the college radio station, you know, hearing different people. And I've always been, you know, I've taken music lessons all my life. And uh, a few years ago, I took up the violin as if, you know, I should have just it's like, hey, sure, why not? The violin is 60. That makes a lot of sense, you know. But it's, I enjoy it, and it's, you know, challenging. And um, and so, but I've never been a great music maker. It's always been hard for me. Uh, it, I shouldn't say hard. It's never come easy to me. Like, I know some people, like, you talked earlier about Marissa, Dr. Marissa Moore. You know, when she was a child, she was, like, you know, uh, an unbelievable musician. You know, the youngest member of the Cleveland Youth Orchestra. She was a flute player. And she's got a beautiful voice and plays piano. And uh, I remember talking to her when she was a kid, and she basically said, it just clicked for her. I don't know how to, I don't even know how to explain it, but that never happened for me. But it still, it never diminished my love for music. And so, I, you know, I listened to a lot of music, listened to a lot of live music. And so when I, you know, when we connected, you know, I started thinking to myself, you know, maybe this is the one thing I can do to, um, for the benefit of orthodoxy, you know, I mean, I can't sing, I can't write music, I can't um, uh, do Byzantine chanting, but what I can do uh, with the gifts I've been given, you know, both, um, you know, I guess, uh, you, know, you know, the gifts I've been given through the success I've been able to have in my life, you know, I can find people to work with that have the same vision and I can support them and be kind of a patron to this effort. Yeah. Well, um, as I've said this uh, before, uh, without that skill set, without uh, the support, um, you know, we wouldn't be talking right now. Yeah. Um, we, with the production that we did, 
uh, uh, would not have occurred. And let's talk a little bit about that because, mm -hmm. so, okay, we're going to do this program. We're going to tell people about it. I mean, we did the things that we're supposed to do. You know, we have a yeah. website and, and uh, we had like a promo video and, you know, and I, you know, put some stuff out on social media and yeah, I mean, we did the things that we're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but you and I both know that typically, and, and it's unfortunate that this, that it's this way, but the rule tends to be that you, you know, you write great music, you have great musicians and great people associated with the project, you promote it like crazy, and nobody shows up. Right. You know, because it's not pop music. It's not, right, right. Uh, it's like a, it's not a mainstream thing. And the program mm -hmm. that we did was a very niche, um, you know, there's only a few people, <laughs> it seems like, that would actually yeah. really be into that. And mm -hmm. yet, we had more than 300 people there. I mean, it kept selling out. I yeah. mean, it was a free program, but we had uh, uh, free ticket sales so we could keep track of, of, of folks. And it kept selling out. I mean, I think we thought that if we could get 100 people there, Oh, yeah. That would be a total slam dunk and a total success. Yeah. We had more than 300 people there, and during the program, it was live streamed. 500 people were watching live, and then yeah. now thousands of people have watched it worldwide yeah. um, the, the world, on yeah. the replays. I think um, it was the last thing, I think it was like 23 countries, last rec numbers I saw in 46 states. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, you're right, it's like, so niche you know but i think that's what works today in the world but it's you know i i hope what we've done is kind of have lit a spark and will encourage other people to uh to pursue you know their ideas I, somebody told me that um that there was a gentleman and i have to reach out to him i think he's up in minnesota that was interested in doing like a bluegrass uh, orthodox mm. you know liturgical music and i'm like that's kind of cool you know um and again, I think, you know, we've talked before about how, you know, orthodoxy has been taken all over the world. And when you go to Africa, they are not singing Greek hymns. They're singing in their native language, Swahili. Uh, right. I've seen it in, in Kenya. And it's like, it's, you know, it connects to, to, it connects on a much more emotional level, you know, when it's sung in their own, you, you know, language. Yeah, and part of the... Uh, the language of the people, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I talked about this on um, Orthodoxy. What What's the name of the program? Um, oh, uh, Ancient Faith oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Today Live. Mm -hmm. uh, when was that? Maybe it was a couple days ago. I talked yeah. about this. And uh, in, in, this, this idea of uh, the language, the, the sort of cultural language and how music is so critical to that, that communication. Mm -hmm. And for, I think, orthodoxy maybe to connect in the way that it's capable of really connecting and the way historically it has connected, it's because the church has been um, wise enough to incorporate um, not just the spoken language, but sort of local traditions uh, as far as music. And that's why yeah. when you go to, to um, you know, an Orthodox service to, in different parts of the world, that's why the, the music sounds different. Right. Um, and obviously the spoken language is different. So uh, one thing in, uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, like African orthodoxy, one one of the things is you would see like hand drums, mm -hmm. you know, the service yeah. or other percussion instruments, and then also dance is like part of the service. Yeah, um, and that's because that's sort of the uh, there's a, like a cultural cachet. There's a there's a uh, an importance of in a significance 
of those uh, those uh, components, those aspects, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and then in the Greek Church, um, what has become commonplace, very com uh, normal, is to have an organ. Right. And now, of course, the organ is not necessarily um, functioning like we might see an organ function, like in a black church or something. Right. Right. But but the organ is there. Yeah. And uh, one thing I thought was interesting about our program was uh, we incorporated percussion and we incorporated um, uh, the B3 organ because yeah. of their their critical, uh, in a black church setting, because of yeah. their critical uh, importance there. But then also because those, uh, those things are also um, integral, integral parts of other orthodox sort of communities. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was an opportunity to bring a lot of different things, yeah. uh, a lot of different things together. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know the history of how the organ got introduced into the, or, the Greek Orthodox Church. I mean, it's obviously it's a Western uh, American, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, um, you know, uh, origins. And so, some, you know, when I talked about this project with some people, they're like, well, that, you know, they, we can't, you know, that's, you know, we're, we can't, uh, you know, go against our traditions. And I'm like, excuse me, but the organ is not part of our tradition. I mean, that, that wasn't, you know, you're not going to go back to Greece and hear an organ play. You know, I think of the organ in our church, it's kind of like a giant pitch pipe, you know, mm -hmm. not really playing, you know, kind of a, like you would hear a, a B3 in a you know African American gospel church, um, right. so I know it, it was funny when we were talking about this project. I was approaching, you know, uh, Metropolitan Savas about his, um, you know, his, you know, blessings, and and uh, we were kind of pushing him like you know he was like oh, okay the B three, and then you know, he we got to the hand drums. He's like, well I don't know about that, you know. And I said, well, how about a funky bass? You know, it's like, well, let's not go that far, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, baby steps. And I can see, though, one of these, one of these days, though, it's going to be, I, I, I just, I want to see the day where we can do an entire liturgy in this gospel tradition with congregation participating, you know, blacks and whites together. That would be the ultimate. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were at the uh, the event, um, the 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 participants, the the folks that showed up to to yeah. to witness, it was really diverse group of people. Oh yeah, um, and I think easily it could have been sort of a monolithic kind of audience. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, but. It was pan orthodox, so there were yeah. a lot of folks from different orthodox communities. Yeah. But then there's also um, uh, a lot of folks from some of the uh, black churches in, yeah. in, you know, in Columbus, in particular. A lot of folks came from the church that I'm the minister of music at, Second Baptist yeah. Church, um, and so I think that made it really feel like. Um, and then, of course, the speakers that we had were were uh, were a nice uh, oh, yeah. match for what it was that we were doing. Father Moses mm -hmm. Berry and uh, Dr. Peter Buteneff, um, uh, and then of course Metropolitan Savas spoke. Yeah. And you know, one thing that was that struck me about uh, uh, <laughs> Father Savas, as he as he wants us to call him, yeah, um, is. Uh, when like after the program no of course i, I met him before um yeah. and but after the program he comes up to me and he's uh uh you know he's he's trying to dap me up and stuff <laughs> which was uh which I, I don't know if i expected that you know yeah. and uh and he and then he sort of talked to me a little bit about why um you know why that approach to it because of yeah. you know where he's from how he grew up yeah. and um and then we talked a little bit about the impact of music uh in uh, on his life and everything and and yeah, so he's a big music lover yeah he sang yeah. in a band he still he still sings in a duo with his brother you know yeah they, you could yeah. He, they call himself uh Mitri. his brother's name is dimitri 
They call themselves mm -hmm. Mitri and the Metro. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share some of those videos, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, again, this speaks to the power of music. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, it speaks to the power of music that um, this entire project, our relationship, um, the fact that Metropolitan Savas wanted to to bless this event, um, encourage this event, support this event, um, come to the event, you know, yeah. preside over the event, all, all of the ways that he was involved in the event, um, uh, it just speaks to the power of music and how how powerful that force is in how it sort of gets in you and yeah. uh um yeah you know i i i've go ahead go ahead well i you know you're talking about the power of music and uh you know you see it all the time and um so uh, when my father was uh in the last years of his life he started um developing dementia and his memory was fading and you know, it was, it was interesting. His short-term memory was not, you know, very, um, it's not, you know, working very well. But his long-term memory was interesting. And so he was living in a retirement community after my mom had passed away. And they would, you know, you know, it was funny. He couldn't remember a lot of things that happened just earlier that day or the day before. But they would have these sing-alongs with, you know, all these people that were in their 80s and 90s. And yet they could remember all the lyrics all the you know to all these songs that they heard as you know 70 80 years ago and so right. you know it's i don't know what it is about music that sort of wires the brain that people can think of that and there's all kinds of studies that talk about you know being exposed to you know you know that whole baby mozart kind of stuff but um yeah there's something i always i'm always suspicious of anyone who says they don't like music you know, mm. or dogs. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with these people? You know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for saying that. And yeah, yeah. Especially the dogs part. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, so the music thing. Um, you know, I'm stuck with music. You know, um, when I, but I mean that in the you yeah, know good. most positive way. Sure. Um, I would be miserable without it. I don't know what my life would have, would be without yeah. music. As a matter of fact, it is music that has um, created the kind of living that I have. That yeah. has uh, that has purchased all the stuff that I have. That has mm -hmm. um, uh, facilitated every meaningful relationship that I have. Yeah. Um, and it's been a, a powerful, uh, it's been a, a, a powerful force in my life. Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> I've said this a couple times in these interviews, but I can't think of any other discipline um, that so easily creates instant friendships. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of, well, I think you, what you hit upon and you are, you know, cause you are a thoughtful person and you kind of think about your place in the world. Um, I have found to me, uh, being a music maker is like such an amazing gift. And some, some of the people I've run into who have that a gift, they don't really appreciate it for the power that it can, that it has. And like you said, you know, you sit down and play, some, play something for someone and it's, you, there's a connection there. You know, there's, I've never seen somebody, you know, sit down at a piano or pick up a guitar or violin and start playing and people walk away. <laughs> you know, it's like mm -hmm. they're drawn to it. It's, it's weird. It's, um, and so those people that have that gift like you do, it's, you know, I don't know if you want to get, you know, you know, obviously we're both, you know, are, have, um, have faith that is it a gift from God, um, and if it is, then it shouldn't be squandered or wasted. Mm. It should be shared. Yes. So um, I heard you say that, uh, in in you know we met before the program. We met in person for the first time. We yeah. you, you brought right. your wife to Columbus, and and we had a 
a nice meal together. Isn't that crazy? In 15, from the time we met, almost 15 years, and we never met in person, even though we're only two hours apart. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Um, which, was, which was really cool. Uh, one thing that I learned about you uh, when, when we met in person was that you had started, and you mentioned it in this interview, that you had started playing violin. Yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Right next to my so, little music room, I got my sheet music out here. So <laughs> let me uh, let me ask, ask you. Don't ask me to play. Don't ask me to play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to play, but I am going to ask you. What does a practice session look like for you? Like, what kind of stuff are you practicing? What are you still um, trying to grapple with as far as just dealing with the instrument? Yeah, I mean, the, my biggest problem with the of the violin is I, actually there was the first instrument I ever played as a kid. I went to you know band tryout in uh, I think elementary school, and I wanted to play the clarinet, but I couldn't get a sound out of the clarinet for whatever reason. I don't know whether somebody wasn't teaching me right or I wasn't, you know, doing whatever. So I just, I, I love the clarinet too. I love every instrument basically. And they're like, oh, how about the violin? Okay, so I took the violin and played around. Then over the years I went, you know, I gravitate towards the guitar because of course, you know, the Beatles and all that kind of influenced. Uh, and I took piano. I took piano for three years in college and um, as an elective. Uh, and so I enjoyed that. But, I, you know, my problem is I never had a lot of discipline and so today you know i you know i'm more patient and you know i'll know i'll never be a virtuoso but i'm doing it because i enjoy it and it's interesting to me and i've always loved the sound of the violin so my basic session is i had a teacher for a number of years when i started i uh, recently stopped working with her and looking for somebody else to sort of um, kind of uh, get re-inspired but i'm doing a lot of online uh, learning and which is an amazing tool. I mean, I think to myself, gosh, I wish I would have had that when I was a kid, YouTube videos and, you know, people teaching, you know, well, there's tons of resources for learning, you know, an instrument or songs. And so um, there's a woman named Mari Black up in, uh, she's up in New England and she's a great fiddle player. You know, she plays primarily Scottish and Irish fiddle tunes and she's really terrific, but she's also a really great teacher. So. She posts a new song every month, and I, you know, try to work through those things. And um, so, you know, I try to practice at least uh, an hour a day, and uh, here in this room, and with my computer next to me, and going back and forth, back and forth. So, it's, uh, you know, helps to keep me sane. You know, you mentioned this thing about uh, the access that we have now to, you know, all of this information. Oh my God! Uh, and like it's all free. I mean, so much yeah. stuff is free, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, yesterday I interviewed uh, the great uh, bass player, uh, online content creator, and music producer Yannick Guizdala. And um, one thing that we were talking about was that I think people below a certain age group um, I I think necessarily don't or or are not in a headspace to be able to really value all of this access to all of this yeah. information in a way that older people are right you know I'm 45 um, and um, it seems like I don't know late 30s mid to late 30s and, and older, I think, are still in a position where they can sort of still really value the fact mm -hmm. that they're able to access all this information yeah, and right. not sort of take it for granted. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, because, you know, when I was coming up, you had to pay for everything. I mean, you had yeah. to actually save money to buy a record. You had to, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then there was a lot of uh, sort of social activities uh, surrounding listening to music. So, for instance, like mm -hmm. when I was in music school, a regular thing that we would do is grab a pizza and listen to the, you know, a, a John Coltrane, you know, record that we hadn't heard collectively yet. And then all the conversations that came out of that. 
um, unfortunately, we're in a situation now where there's so much YouTube footage where I think people feel like they um, don't have to have the sort of social interaction. Um, you know, the actual social interaction, not the right. social media interaction. Yeah, right, right. Um, and uh, so I think, and then again, you know, social media, I think, um, for all of the positive things that I think it can offer, I think creates an illusion that we are more connected than we actually are. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Yeah, there's, you know, they're kind of like, oh, I have all these friends, and, you know, my, you know, it's like, you know, one of the, my light bulb moments of, you know, Facebook when I was on it was I was at a restaurant, and there was a, one of my Facebook friends at the restaurant, and I'm like, God, God, I don't want to talk to him. And then I thought to myself, well, why am I friends with him on Facebook if I don't want to talk to him in person? <laughs> so it's like, so <laughs> then my, so I'm like, there was a light bulb moment, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be on Facebook. Ah, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, honest, oh my gosh, it's like, what am I doing? You know, why do I have you know, all these people that you know, you know, as if they care what I'm doing, and and I, the reality is, I don't care uh, that uh, they care what I'm doing. And but you're right. I mean, I think younger people sort of take this technology for granted. You know, I'm six, uh, 63. You know, closing in on 64, and. Um, when I think to myself growing up uh, like I did, in, you know, around the radio business and you had big vinyl records, you know, LPs and, um, you know, your library was, you know, this huge physical space to house a thousand albums, you know, and then you realize in a size of, a, you know, when the iPod first came out, you go, oh my gosh, I have the entire, I can have an entire music library in a device that's the size of a pack of cigarettes. I mean, and then of course with streaming with Spotify, you know, it, it, to me it's a miracle. It's like they have virtually every song that's ever been recorded, you know, accessible at the press of a button. I mean, that's just, yeah. you know, insane to me. And, um, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm glad I'm like, you know, the age I am so I can appreciate it, you know, but not, if I think if I was a little older, you know, I wouldn't even be, you know, I know some guys that are actually, you know, around my age and, you know, who are not into, you know, they, they're just not the technological savvy as uh, they could be. But I think you're right about the uh, people mistake having followers and friends on these different social media platforms as being socially connected. And, it, and to me, when you, uh, I like doing a lot of, uh, going to a lot of live music shows. Uh, in small venues, I'm not really big on the uh, arena shows anymore. Uh, but when you get into a small venue and you see a great band uh, who are kind of in sync and playing with you know fervor and passion, last year I got to see Del McCurry and his you know band his two sons and the bluegrass band, and you know the crowd was really into it and. Their musicianship was so impeccable, and you know when they would, you know, when they would kick it into high gear, it's like, you know, it's like magic. It's like they're just, you know, you've seen it, you've experienced it, you know, you've experienced it as a musician. I've never experienced from that point of view, but it, it's it, it connects people, you know, on a gut level, you know, the musicians with the audience. Um, and you're right, music is a social thing. The uh, whole uh, idea of, you know, I can listen, you know, my, everyone's got their own Spotify playlist, everyone's, you know, there's no that, um, that connection that used to be so uh, readily apparent with music is you have to work at it today. You know, before, you remember, you could you'd be driving down the street and the radio's playing in the car and the guy pull up next to you, hey, I could tell he's listening to the same radio station and it'd be like, a little bond between you, like, hey, man, how's it going? You know, or at the beach, people would be listening to the same record or same radio station. And there was like that social connection. You know, you kind of realize that you were part of the same tribe for that moment. Uh, and today, with, you know, technology has done a lot to bring the world to you, but it's also done a lot to keep people apart, you know. So, you know, we're in this quarantine. Yeah. And, um, 
uh, this quarantine, uh, I think, uh, created this sort of on edge, um, you know, isolation and mm -hmm. anxiety that yeah. uh, has kind of been a powder keg for this, uh, a lot of these racial riots that we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, George Floyd, uh, what, what happened there, I think everybody agrees that that was, that was terrible. Obviously, the policemen should be, you know, in jail. They just amended the, uh, yeah, I saw that. the, yeah, the murder three to murder two and, and uh, then the arrested, the, too. yeah, charged yeah. the other officers. Um, and, uh, so it's a kind of a different kind of time right now in this quarantine um, I've heard several times by uh, like uh, Protestant uh, sort of communities Christian communities mm -hmm. um, that you know in some way you know having churches online doing the thing online is 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 a uh, is better, you know, or is, um, you know, hey, you know, we got to move into the 21st century. And, and I've heard this kind of conversation about it and sort of downplaying the importance of attending church in person. There's a yeah. lot of uh, sort of, um, there's a sentiment that, you know, we are the church, you know, the people are the church. And so you don't need the building. You don't right. need, you know, whatever. And there's some of that, that I, that I agree with. Um, I definitely, we are the church that, that is the, that is the truth. It, it, it is the people, but, um, matter matters, uh, having a physical, uh, uh a physical proximity to other people, um, the dissemination of the sacraments, you know, all of that stuff, um, you know, in Orthodox Church is all taking place in a, a physical location that right. was hallowed uh, for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in an Orthodox Church, when you face the altar, you're facing east. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason for that. And there's a proximate, uh, th there's a uh, there's a proximity, there's an orientation, you know, there's all of that stuff that, um, you know, that, you know, that I've missed so much, especially over the last, you know, couple, couple months. Yeah. Um, and now we're seeing that, uh, especially in the Midwest, a lot of, ch a lot of churches are now starting to have services again in in, yeah. in person uh, of course there's a limitation on the number of people that can be present um mm -hmm. but um that whole like physical communal community uh kind of thing i mean you were kind of uh intimating that not with spirituality for say per se but when you were talking about attending concerts and especially right. those concerts being more intimate spaces where you can actually interact with the people and you actually have an opportunity to potentially meet, meet with the artist or at right. least you're close enough to the artist to where you feel like you actually met them mm -hmm. as opposed to like being in an arena kind of situation right. or watching something on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I understand the need for... Uh, especially in a situation like we're in right now to utilize technology to the fullest to do what we can do uh, to sort of maintain a certain continuity. But I also think that to suggest that it is equivalent is a mistake. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, it's interesting that we have, I'm on our parish council here at St. Demetrius in Rocky River, and there is a huge appetite for people to get back to church and attend services. Yeah. Uh, we're going very slow because of, uh, you know, state regulations and wanting to make sure people are safe. Uh, but it's, um, you know, one of my concerns was people were going to get used to the idea of 
not going to church and watching it online and and I think that's just a poor substitute for uh, you know being in person with you know people that you are part of the same community and I think you're um, you know you're right it's no different than kind of a live intimate musical performance I mean you know people are social animals they are uh, you know you want to be uh, if, you know even like online shopping oh that's great very convenient but there's something about being out at a mall or a you know, shopping district, you know, walking around, looking, you know, the whole kind of with your friends. I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, I don't think that'll ever, you know, the desire will ever go away. Hopefully it never does. I mean, in spite of all this technology, I think it's, um, um, you know, the need for human interaction, I don't think is ever gonna go away. Yeah, in in almost sort of uh, reminds me of some kind of a sci-fi movie where, yeah, you know, because of some, uh, uh, you know, world-ending kind of event, everyone yeah. moves underground. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and every and and, and after genera- yeah, right, and and after generations of that, you know, uh, everyone has lost the pigment. <laughs> and their skin and and and, yeah. and 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 are unrecognizable you know yeah. it's it, it, i i am concerned that um you know i i don't know what it's going to be like uh for you know freelance musicians in particular i don't know what it's going to be like after this whole thing has started to you know really when it's once it's gone away i i don't know that it'll ever quite be the same um i think a lot of musicians uh, artists are using this as an opportunity to develop some online content Mm -hmm. um and i think that that's positive as a supplement as a an additional aspect of their musicianship but that's never going to be um to my in in my mind that'll never be as important as the role that these musicians play out out in the community playing and connecting people yeah i I, you know to me i think uh i read a book years ago i think it was called future shock or third wave one of the one of those two and ended it talked about um high tech and high touch and you know this is going back a long time ago i mean and so when they first the VCR was first introduced. It's like, oh, people are not going to go to the movies anymore. They're just going to stay home and watch, you know, watch it on, you know, their TVs. And, you know, the opposite was the, the, was the case. People, the more high tech there was, there was more a desire for high touch. And people were flocking to theaters because they wanted that social component. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic about our current situation. I think what's going to happen is that after, uh, you know, there's always already a strong desire to get back to some sense of normalcy. And some people might say it's kind of a reckless desire because you saw that a couple of weeks ago down in the Ozarks or Houston when they just, you know, hey, we're open for business and these gigantic pool parties all packed together. And um, so I think there's people are going to want to go back to a sense of uh, normalcy, what it was, say, you know, six months ago. And, um, you know, want to be together with other people. And, and I think, you know, music is one of the things that, you know, separates us from all other kind of, you know, life forms on the planet, our ability to make music and make it together. So I think that's, you know, to me, something that I think if people value it even more in the future, and uh, especially in a live setting, as opposed to um, being on YouTube or any other kind of digital means. I hope I'm right. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope so too. You know, um, you know, you're talking, and and I was thinking again uh, back about the uh, how sweet the sound project, um, yeah. and the whole idea behind that. Yeah, I mean, we 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 streamed it live, but that's not necessarily to take precedence over the experience that people actually have when they actually attended the event and i think obviously it's it's a different thing um 
you were you were talking about um, sort of online church being a, a poor substitute for going to church in person. Yeah. In, in my mind, I might go a step further than that. I might say that it's not a substitute. Um, it's a filler. Um, sort of, um, you know, there's aspects of it that, you know, it's like, it's like you know, you, there's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of uh, uh, pastors, teachers, preachers that, you know, they, uh, they broadcast their sermons you know, and that's been right. something that's been a, a regular thing. And I always get a lot out of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, no lie, I've learned a whole lot that way. But it's not really the same as going to church. Um, you know, um, uh, and, you know, I was thinking about <clears throat> um, these sort of overwhelming emotional <laughs> response that I had uh, even when trying to get started get, get our program started yeah. to come up and do the first selection and um, you know I had the I had uh, the organ and the in the percussionist I had them start yeah. you know to play kind of a drone and it took me a long time to get started because I was really I, I was trying to compose myself and to control the yeah. intense emotion that I was experiencing. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, I doubt that I would have had that intense of an emotional feeling if I was sort of, if we were sort of doing like, and it was still for the first time, but we were sort of streaming live. Yeah, without an audience. You know, Without yeah, an I audience, think, I don't think you would have had that emotional experience. You know, it was the, the people behind you that you were didn't want to disappoint, and and you know you were going to you know you put so much heart and soul into this thing that if there wasn't for that live audience there, I don't think you would have had that same emotional um, reaction. You know, it would have been more clinical um, without that audience there. And I think that's what the power of these, these being at a live church service. You know, you come out of a church service, you know, hopefully feeling better. You know, sometimes I've come out feeling worse, you know, because not because of the service, but because my, uh, you know, what I'm thinking, what's going on in my head for whatever craziness that I'm thinking about and not uh, focusing on the church at hand. But, you know, you don't have that when you finish watching an internet service. It's like, eh, you know, it's like to me, it's like just watching like a, an episode of, uh, you know, uh, Storage Wars. <laughs> you know, there's like no, there's, there's no emotional feeling after watching a service online, for, at least for me. Yeah, well, and there's also this uh, sense of anonymity, right? You know, that yeah. you have. Like, you actually you realize that, yeah, okay, so there's like this joke that, you know, everybody is playing on. It's like a meme now, right? The thing about, you know, we're doing all these online meetings and nobody has pants on, you know? Yeah, right. And uh, so I it's... I have pants it's on, once you're <laughs> Me too. Uh, they're jeans, um, but they're not. <laughs> but it's just uh, the the sense of anonymity. Yeah. Uh, it just does different things to people. And, and you were, yeah. you know, kind of to loop back to the whole social media thing. And with some of the, of the like online bullying and stuff that that takes place uh, yeah. often, a lot of it takes place again because there's this right. anonymity. There's this like, yeah. these aren't real people, or okay, it's real people, but they can't see me doing what I'm doing. Right. Um, and it just, I, I just think it takes a, it does. It just creates a lesser uh, intense experience. Um, we, we're not ourselves as engaged. Um, and I understand that we have to do what we have to do, and we need to talk as much as we can positive, uh, positively about what it is that we're doing because, yeah. you know, if you're talking like all negative and dark about it, then why is anybody going to tune in right. at all? And right. I, I, exactly. I get that. I, I 
I understand that, but I, but I also think that it's important for us to not try to act like uh, uh, this these online versions of what we've been doing are yeah. anywhere equivalent to um, you know actually you know partaking, actually being present. Um, yeah, the I physical agree. proximity. All right. Well, is there anything, Lee, that you uh, that you want to say that uh, um, or maybe something you want to, I don't know, something you want to plug or talk about that uh, we didn't talk about? No, I, I think other than um, direct people to how sweet the sound dot net and let them kind of experience, you know, uh, you know, kind of get a taste of what we did. And, yeah. you know, if they have any ideas to reach out to either one of us, on how to you know move the this project forward like i said you know when i first started talking to this about you it was like the finish line was the event on february 1st and afterwards and seeing the reaction of people i realized it was you know uh, this is this term i didn't come up with this term but other people use it it's it's the um, end of the beginning you know yeah. it's not the end so it's like the first step towards something greater. And I'm hoping that it'll excite people and want them to want to do something, you know, with us and support us. And we're open to all kinds of ideas. And if we can, and like I said earlier, if my goal is to have a full liturgy in the gospel tradition with participation by the entire congregation and having a very diverse group of people there to pray together that would be uh that would be the topper for me yeah me too um i think that we have um we have more of the vespers i think that we can uh that we can also do yeah uh, i think we only covered like maybe a third or maybe as much as a half of the actual yeah narrative mm -hmm. the the verbiage there yeah. um and so there's a lot that can be done there and then definitely uh divine liturgy would be uh that would be a beautiful beautiful thing yeah. thank good. you so much uh, thank you so thank much you, leaf yes thank you so much for uh for your time and energy and uh i pray for you your family our community uh i pray for our, our world um, that we can, um, uh, you know, have peace. That yeah. we can have peace. Yeah, and, just be uh, the dark time and and yeah. look at it, look towards a brighter future for everyone. Yes. Well, God bless Thanks. you. Thanks, John. Take care of yourself. All, All right, right bye bye. You too. Bye. See you.